Well, if you have your Bibles with you, let me invite you to turn to Exodus 17, 1 to 7. You'd be helped to keep the pages of, the, uh, of that text open. There'll be times when I'm going to refer to that text um, and maybe even other texts in the book of Exodus. And you want to make sure that what I'm saying is actually what's in the text. Let me begin by praying for us. Father, we need your help. We need to see the problem of our hearts. We need to see the majesty of Jesus. Oh God, lead us to the rock that is higher than us. Amen. What is it about quarreling and grumbling that puts us off when we see it in other people? Why are parents often correcting their children when they quarrel and grumble? How did they ever learn to fight over toys, push and hit each other and scowl and get angry over something that we as parents or even teachers would think is insignificant? What do we do when we grumble over that long hour drive in traffic? Or when the rents skyrocket? when the produce in the market is just not as fresh as they used to be, or when we don't get paid. It's very likely that there's someone in your life right now that you are avoiding, solely because all you ever hear from them is their persistent quarreling and grumbling. They're seldom wrong, and nothing seems to satisfy them. What about the world we live in? At this very moment, nations are waging wars with one another, uh, willing to cause sweeping deaths solely because they want to get what they want. But they aren't the only ones with the problem. Spouses are grumbling and fighting with one another. Friends are becoming enemies. Whole families are being torn apart. Office dramas leave us having to pick sides and then experience cold shoulders. I mean, even with scam callers, the people whom we have the least amount of relationship with, the moment we smell a scam, we'll fight. What about quarreling and grumbling against God? I wonder if you've ever asked questions like this. Why did you bring me here to Dubai just to struggle? Why are my debts piling up? and I'm no better than I was before? Why is my life a mess right now? Why have you taken this one thing that I wanted so dearly away from me? Why don't you answer my prayer, oh God? Where are you? You know, just this week, uh, I was in a conversation with an atheist who claimed that he had no desire to believe in God. We were inviting him to read the Bible with us, and he said, well, why should I read the Bible? Because I just don't care to believe in God or that he exists. I wonder if you're a non-Christian visiting us today and if that describes your perspective. Well, if you think that you don't have time for God and that believing in God is foolish, I want to say this to you kindly. You need to understand that you are actually revealing that you are at war with God. Our text this morning has us looking at a whole nation quarreling and grumbling. And it isn't with one another, but it is with God and God's chosen leader. Before we read Exodus 17, I want to give us some context. In the beginning of the book of Exodus, the Israelites had gone from a life of peace and security to a life of oppression and slavery. Male children were being killed and workload was increasing. But God hears his people cry and appears to Moses at Mount Horeb, promising deliverance out of Egypt for the Israelites. It wouldn't come easy. Ten plagues would inflict the Egyptians. Pharaoh would not let them go until the tenth plague when God would strike all the firstborn children in Egypt. And the only thing that would shield the Israelites from the judgment would be the blood of the lamb spread on their doorpost. The firstborns die, and Israel flees into the wilderness, journeying into the promised land. 
There the firstborn of Israel are consecrated. The feast is celebrated. God shelters and guides his people by a cloud by day and fire by night. And then they cross the Red Sea. As Moses strikes and splits the waters with his staff so that the people could cross over. And then when the Egyptians came running, they were swallowed up in the water and they died. God's people rejoiced because of their deliverance, but not for very long. As they journeyed into the wilderness, they were met with trials. Bitter water, no bread, no meat to be found. And now the book turns from the problem of Egypt to the problem within the Israelites. From Exodus 15 to our section, three times, we read that the people of God grumbled and complained and quarreled. And yet time and time again, God would intervene, turning the bitter water sweet, pouring manna from heaven and quail. God said that he would test them to see if they would follow him and obey his commands. What will they do? Listen as I read Exodus 17, 1 to 7. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people taking with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? It seems like nothing has changed from Exodus 15 and 16. But if you paid attention, you will notice in our text that God still provides for his people. Look, if you're here quarreling and grumbling against God, I want to encourage you not to switch off right now, but to pay attention to God's word right now and see what God does for the Israelites. I've been praying that the Lord would use this text to help you see that he is all that you need right now. Here's my main point if you're taking notes. Quarreling and grumbling sinners need to behold God's lasting provision. Quarreling and grumbling sinners need to behold God's lasting provision. In order to see that, I think our text reveals two things. Those would be my two points in, in my sermon. One, from verses 1 to 4, we will see the problem of quarreling and grumbling. And then verses 5 to 7, we'll see the solution for quarrelers and grumblers. We'll look at the problem, and then we'll find the solution. Let me begin by thinking about our first point, the problem of quarreling and grumbling. We'll consider that from verses 1 to 4, but let's begin by considering the setting in verse 1. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. You know, a number of years ago, uh, while Ruth and I were driving to Oman, I took a wrong turn, and in the late hours of the night, we found ourselves on this single lane, long stretch of driving in pure darkness, surrounded by mountains and cargo trucks. For me, it was the most terrifying moment of my life. I remember pushing my seat up, peering through the glass as I held tightly to the steering wheel, looking for the closest sight of light. And all we had was each other, Google Maps, and my complaining. 
navigating us through what seemed like uncharted territories. But that is not what's going on in verse 1. Notice how the people move. This is not an accidental plan, not some half-hearted attempt to get out of the wilderness. They were making their way according to the commandment of the Lord, camping at Rephidim. God brought them here. We need to begin here as we consider the problem of quarreling and grumbling. Look, it should be of no surprise that that's when Moses begins in order for us to see the problem of the text. You know, more often than not, at the heart of our grumbling and quarreling, especially against God, is that our words have taken precedence over God's words. We have allowed our thoughts and our feelings of the situation, whether good or bad, to bear greater weight than what God has promised or what God is doing. It should be obvious then why we are unable to see God at work. It's not that God has grown silent, but rather we have grown deaf and mute. My friend, does that describe you? Look back at verse 1. We see the problem, right, in the story. There is no water. And lest we be overly critical, we who live in the UAE know a little bit of what it's like to live in the desert, even though it's a city. It's likely that they would have journeyed for days to get here, probably stored up water enough to make it to this resting point. And here they are, a tired and thirsty people, and there's no water. Yeah, I remember a time when I was growing up and there was a water shortage in Sharjah, and we had to buy water tanks and line up at the Ajman desalination plant to fill up water for the month. There was a long line of grumblers and complainers, including our family. But what we should pay attention to is what they do when faced with a problem. Look at verses 2 and 3. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? You know, from seeing the problem, they quarrel. Really, they fight and argue and turn to making demands. Not of God, but of Moses. They demand of Moses. Moses, you give us water. Moses is their leader, even their mediator. But he is not their provider in the same way that God is their provider. And Israel should have known this, having just witnessed two miraculous provision of water and food from out of nowhere. But then look at what their demand, where their demands take them in verse 3. Oh, they've chosen to, forgot, to forget what God has done. And instead, they've made false conclusions. Oh, Moses, you brought us here because you want us to die. You want to kill us. Well, haven't they forgotten all that Egypt entailed for them? In Exodus 1.16, the king of Egypt says, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. Have they forgotten God's promise to the Israelites through Moses in Exodus 3? Then the Lord said, I have seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. When their real need is not met, they conclude that Moses and God do not have good purposes for them. You know, we need to understand that that attitude can easily be found in us, especially if we're prone to quarreling and grumbling. It is very likely that part of the reason we are grumbling and quarreling is because we have made a false conclusion about what's really going on. I mean, they've turned something that was evil into something that is good for them, something that they really need. They've concluded that life in Egypt, slavery included, is good. They have made an ideal, I-D-E-A-L, a perfect standard out of Egypt. But more seriously, I think it is because they have made Egypt an ideal 
that they're angry at God because God seems to have taken it away from them. They don't see the problem of Egypt right now. Their ideal has become like an idol, I-D-O-L. An idol is anything or anyone we worship, that which we deeply desire and crave apart from God. You know, that's what sin does. Sin distorts something that is evil and colors it to make it look like it is good, as if it really will meet our need. Satan hides the truth that the consequence of sin is slavery and death. You know, my friends, I, I, I want to ask you, I want you to think about your most recent quarrel, or maybe your biggest reason for grumbling right now. If it'd be help, maybe write it down. Have you made an ideal into an idol? You know, whether it's the good desire for a relationship or how you want your friends and your family to perceive and treat you, how you want your children to behave, what you expect from your jobs. Or maybe it's that expectation that you require from your spouse. If you are currently mad at God or quarreling with someone, could it be that you are actually worshiping your ideal more than God? Your ideal has become your idol. You know, remember our text speaks of the whole congregation of Israel, so we need to think about this as a church. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray that our church be never known for its grumbling, but rather for its obedience to God's word. Pray for that. Pray that we would grow to obey God's word. But consider this. I wonder if you ever grumbled about the way we do things as a church. Is there a personal preference you're holding on to that has become more like a perfect standard that you require in a church? Have you considered whether what you hold on to is a biblical requirement or a personal preference of how you think things should be? Could that be the reason why you're frustrated right now? Why you're quarreling right now? If you hear something being presented as a biblical requirement but you don't agree with it, would you be willing to look at the Bible to consider whether they are wrong or you are wrong? Ask for God's Spirit to help you. You know, from this text, we see that the problem of a spirit of quarreling and grumbling begins with not listening to God, rather listening to ourselves. It grows into arguing, which leads to demanding and then making false conclusions. But finally, it leads to taking matters into our own hands. Look at that last line in verse 4. Moses says to God, they are almost ready to stone me. They are ready to do what the Egyptians wanted to do to them, kill. See, this is when the sin of quarreling and grumbling bears its full fruit. Once we have falsely concluded that we are right and they are wrong or God is wrong, we conceive ways of rejecting, avoiding, doing away with the person, speaking ill of them, speaking ill of God we reach the highest point of fighting with God when we want to figuratively put God to death in our lives, when we want nothing to do with God anymore. Brothers and sisters, I do not preach to you as someone who does not quarrel or grumble. I sin in much the same way when I fight with my wife, fighting to prove to be right and perfect while putting her down with my words. I see this in myself when I grumble against the Lord when life is just too hard and too frustrating to me. You know, this is why we need to fight our desires for quarreling and grumbling by analyzing the reasons for why we do it in light of God's word. But look back to verse 2. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? You know, what we fail to see is that our relation, our relational issues with one another often speaks volumes of the potential relational issues we have with God. Let me say that again. We fail to see that our relational issues that we really have with one another has the potential 
to speak volumes of our relational issues with God. When Moses uses the word test, it's like the people of Israel have gone and taken God to court, ready to pronounce him to be the guilty one and they the innocent. Well, according to them, what makes God guilty? Look at that very last line in verse 7. The test, is the Lord among us or not? They have concluded God is not here and God does not care. Therefore, he's guilty. And forgetting all that God had done and in, test, and in their testing of God, what they really are revealing is that they are hard-hearted to God. My non-Christian friend, I want to say this to you, that this is what's happening between you and God. You have concluded that he is guilty and that you are innocent. But if you are honest, if you were to really consider your life, you and I would know that we are the guilty ones, and God is not. Parents, you know, when we catch our children fighting with one another, we need to realize that we have a God-given opportunity to help them see that their quarreling with one another is evidence that they're hostile to God. They're enemies with God, fighting with Him. You know, the same is true when we hear Christians quarrel with each other. We need to do what Moses does here. You know, instead of just joining the pity party of false reasons for quarreling, we need to ask the question, why are you doing this? Why are you quarreling right now? What is the real reason you are quarreling? Not what is the real reason why they make you quarrel. What is the real reason why you quarrel? But we don't stop there. We want to go to God's word. Just like Moses points out that they are testing the Lord, we need to help people see how God sees the situation. Let me think about reading James chapter 4, 1 to 12 with them. Ask them, oh, how are you doing the same things you see in this section in James 4? How are you not submitting to God right now? You know, Moses sees the real problem and does what Israel once did when they were wrapped up in slavery in Egypt. He cries out to the Lord who hears. Moses prays. I mean, he laments. He makes the request known to God. The one who brought them out of Egypt and the one who has brought them to Rephidim where there is no water. My brothers and sisters, you know, we have to understand our lack of needs and op our opportunities to lament, plead with God, plead for the Lord to provide. I think there is a right way to make our needs known to him, learning how to hold it loosely, asking for the Lord's will to be revealed in this situation and then applying our trust in him. Could it be that the Lord brought them out to Rephidim to test whether they would trust God's words and his promise to lead them until they reach the promised land? If he's the one who's leading them, won't he show his care for them now? So even we too, those of us who have been redeemed from slavery to sin and now make our way to the new heaven and earth, we should entrust all our lives to God who keeps his promise to keep his children to the very end. Our God is so good, and in our next section, we see his goodness and justice and mercy displayed for those in times of need. We'll consider that in our next point, the solution for quarrelers and grumblers, verses 5 to 7. God hears Moses' cry on behalf of the Israelites and promises to provide water for them. But unlike in the previous two chapters, God will go about making a provision in an unusual manner. We should see this as God's goodness being displayed for the Israelites. Uh, I want to encourage you as I uh, reread that section for you to listen carefully and recollect to the time when you last read Exodus if you've heard any of the words I'm about to read before in Exodus. Well, pay attention. Let me see if you, if you can remember. Verse 5, And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders, and take in your hand the staff with which you strike the Nile, and go, 
And behold, I will stand before you there at the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of that place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Notice in verses 5 and 6, the words pass on, take, strike, stand, and Horeb, and water. Now, these are all words that you will find in previous sections in Exodus. And they offer an interpretive lens for us to make sense of what's going on here. Think back to Exodus 3. God meets Moses through the burning bush at Mount Horeb. Much like what happens there, God stands again in our section, revealing himself. In Exodus 11, God passed over Egypt as an act of judgment. Here in our section, Moses passes on before the people. Where the people in Exodus 11 take the blood, here Moses takes the elders and the staff used to strike the Nile, turn it to blood, In Exodus 11, God struck the Egyptians with the death to the firstborn. And the only thing that shielded the Israelites was the blood of the lamb. Here in our section, Moses takes the staff, which he used in Egypt, but there is no lamb shielding the Israelites. But God, standing at Mount Horeb. How are we to make sense of what's going on? You know, in their hard-heartedness, the Israelites tested the Lord, pronouncing their judgment over him. In the Bible, God uses the rock as a depiction of himself, a picture depicting that his ways are just and perfect. Like an immovable rock, he is the God of faithfulness and without iniquity. God is once again, through Moses, about to execute judgment. And the ones who deserve it are the Israelites for their quarreling and their grumbling and their hard-heartedness. God is judged instead in the place of the guilty. Did you notice that? Moses strikes the rock upon which God himself stands, picturing an execution of judgment on God himself, though he is thoroughly undeserving. But what happens next? This immovable, unshakable rock, when struck, breaks forth with gushing water. God provides, my friends, water for his people. Through judgment comes undeserving, definite provision. You could even say God's grace and mercy is shown to the undeserving Israelites in his provision of temporal salvation. God's grace and mercy is being shown to the undeserving Israelites by his provision of temporal salvation. God was doing this not because Israel was somehow winning God's favor, we know, but in spite of it. Now Moses later would write in Psalm 105, he, that is God, opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. God remembered his promise to Abraham that he would be blessed with offspring outnumbering the stars and through him all the nations would be blessed. He was speaking of Israel. And so when he rescues the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, it was his promise to Abraham that was in view. And though the Israelites deserve to be judged and die right now in the wilderness, God saves them on the basis of his promise the promise he made to their forefathers. God is revealing that though the people fail, God does not fail to keep his promise. His scene is meant to be a memory etched in the minds of the Israelites. So etched that in verse 7, Moses renames the place and to remind them to tell future generations that this is where we grumbled against God. That right there, that, that place, Masa Meribah, that's when we stood against God and argued with him. You know that place there that we've told you about? That's when we showed that we don't trust God and we were wrong. Beloved, 
We need to see the consequence that sinners who quarrel and grumble against God deserve. And then be stunned at what we see in this text. Really, all throughout the Bible, as God's people continue in their hard-heartedness, we need to realize that we are no different from them. Oh, how foolish it is to stand against God. The real reason we persist in grumbling and quarreling with God is because somehow we have, we have conceived that we don't deserve to be judged. Maybe others, but not me. I'm fine. I'm fine just the way that I am. My non-Christian friend, if you are here, I want you to understand if that's what you believe, you are greatly mistaken. That's not true. You know, the themes we see in the section of Exodus continue to unfold in the rest of the Old Testament. Later on, when the people of God would be in exile, because of their hard-heartedness, Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah, 50, Isaiah 53, 4, 4 and 5, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. Just like God acted in Exodus 17, Isaiah prophesies that God will act once again through one who will be our grief bearer, our sorrow carrier, the one who will be struck, smitten by God and afflicted so that we could have peace and spiritual healing. Who is this person but Jesus Christ himself? My friend, if you are feeling burdened because of your quarreling and grumbling, my friend, let us look to Jesus Christ. This is Jesus who in John 4, 14 says, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 7, 37 and 39, Jesus cries, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then pay attention to John's comment. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 makes the conclusion that this text points to Jesus, that Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock of our salvation who was struck, sentenced to death, pierced for our transgression, including our grumbling and our quarreling and our hard-heartedness. He dies in the place of the sinner. And he rose again so that all who would believe in him will gain everlasting life out of whose hearts will flow the Holy Spirit, whose hearts will be transformed by that Spirit. Look back at that last line in verse 6. Unlike the people of God, Moses stands with eyes of faith and obeys God's word to the very end. I mean, what, what else would motivate a man to go strike a rock but that he would have trusted that God will keep his promise and will provide for his people again? You know, unlike the people's question, is the Lord among us or not? Moses and the elders see the presence of God and likely realize how gracious it is that God would choose to dwell with sinners like them and sinners like us. Well, maybe you're wondering, well, you know, that's great. That's Exodus 17, but that doesn't solve my problem. I can think of a reason why I want to quarrel right now and, and be angry and grumble. What does Exodus 17 have to do with us now when life is hard and people are frustrating? Is it sufficient to just read the text and tell, tell ourselves, I'm just going to stop grumbling and never grumble again? Well, you and I know that's not possible. <laughs> the fact that you're considering why you grumble tells you that you can't fix it. You can't get rid of your, your complaining and grumbling and quarreling. So we have to ask the question, 
How does the death and resurrection of Jesus impact how I think about quarreling and grumbling? How does Jesus' death and resurrection impact how I think about my quarreling and my grumbling? I really have three applications. One, the cross helps us analyze why we quarrel and grumble. It helps us analyze why we grumble and quarrel. You know, in light of the cross, we need to learn to ask the question or get godly friends to ask the question, why do I find myself constantly prone to quarreling and grumbling? Why do I find myself constantly prone to quarreling and grumbling? You know, my friends, this is where I am at my weakest. I want to focus all the attention on my circumstance and on what people have done for me. But Jesus enables us to direct our attention to our heart problem. The cross enables us to see that our quarreling and grumbling is sin. That's the lesson for the Israelites and for us. You know, the world says we quarrel because we just don't get what we want. Because people don't serve us the way, they, the, the way we want to be served. What they want to blind us from is seeing that quarreling and grumbling is often selfishly motivated. But with our eyes on the cross, we ask, how am I practicing selfishness as I persist in an attitude of quarreling and grumbling? How am I being selfish? Or maybe we want to ask the question, what is the Lord teaching me by not giving me what I dearly want? You know, more often the Spirit is at work opening our eyes to see our sin. So plead with God's Spirit to help you discern the thoughts and intentions of your heart right now. If your life reveals a pattern of persistent quarreling and grumbling, a life where you are never wrong and they are always wrong, could it be that the reason you do that is because you have not been saved by Jesus' blood? There is no real change in your life. No evidence of it. But my friend, you can do it now. <laughs> you can turn away from your sin and you can believe in Jesus Christ who changes our hearts and live for him. Here's my second application. We need to begin by analyzing why. Then we need to learn to behold. Specifically, learn to behold the cross. You see that, that word in verse 6, behold. A Christian's life is marked by a daily beholding of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There we see the payment was paid in full on behalf of the guilty ones. You know, when we treat the gospel as old news, our quarreling and our grumbling will likely become the good news we think we, we need. Our outlook on life will either be shaped by the death and resurrection of Jesus or by unceasing quarreling and grumbling. Scottish pastor Robert Murray McShane teaches us how to do it. Here's what he says. Learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. You see that again? For every look at yourself, at your sin, take ten looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely. Such infinite majesty and yet such meekness and grace and all for sinners, even the chief. Live much in the smiles of God. Bask in his beams. Feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love and repose, really fall back into his almighty arms. The answer for quarrelers and grumblers is to learn to fix our eyes on Jesus. It's to learn to look to Jesus and leave our quarreling and grumbling and our worries aside. We lay our unmet needs at Jesus' feet and ask for him to change us first before he changes our situation. So analyze why, to behold the cross, and finally, the cross 
calls us to lay down our lives, even our desires. Jesus Christ came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You know, the Israelites ultimately wanted to be served. And, they, and if not, they would take matters into their own hands. It is likely that that's what we're doing right now. If we persist in quarreling and grumbling, taking matters into our own hands. But you see, those who have been ransomed by Jesus Christ learn to serve like our Savior, especially with our words. We're willing to suffer for Jesus' sake. But that, that means spending that extra hour patiently in traffic, not getting angry at the people that cut you in the lane. Or whether that means drawing near to the people that cause you to grumble. The cross means that we learn to reevaluate the words we use against others and against God, whether private or public. We have the opportunity to confess and ask the Lord to forgive us. Ask people whom we have hurt to forgive us. Quarreling and grumbling will leave us with no space in our lives to proclaim the majesty of Jesus. Quarreling and grumbling is likely the reason why you are refusing to pray to God right now. Don't do that. We work to speak well of God's redeemed people, even if, even if we may not always agree with them. We bear up patiently because Jesus bore up with us, with our sin. Exodus 17, 1 to 7 is a beautiful picture of God's grace. Brothers and sisters, we should expect that while we make our pilgrim journey to our final destination, we will experience all kinds of trials, the kinds of trials that might leave us wanting to quarrel and grumble and be angry at God. But we need to remember the quarreling and grumbling sinners need to behold God's lasting provision. At the heart of these trials lies the question from God, Will you trust me once again to lead you until you are home with me? Or will you grumble and fight with me? When life leaves us grumbling and frustrated, we should realize that this is not our home. We journey forward with our eyes fixed on Jesus, our Savior. I wonder if you know this old hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Let me read the, the third verse. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter and my soul athirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, look, a spring of joy I see. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we need for you to lead us. We need your help to understand the problem of our hearts, especially as we consider our words and our quarreling. Father, when faced with trials, lead us to Jesus. Lead us to the rock where springs of joy are awaiting us. Pray this for your namesake. Amen.